you've changed since the last time I was here. <laughs> it's been years. I did have the joy of being back here with my wife for the 30th of uh, the 30th anniversary of the start of Meadowbrook Church, and it's a joy to be back here with you again. Most of you in the room don't even know who I am, right? <laughs> yeah, I see. <laughs> who are you? I'm saying the same thing, by the way. <laughs> But I, I have to say that um, you are what we prayed for when a group of people gathered together down in Hart Park where the ice skating rink was with 20 people in the room, just anticipating that God would do something and God would call us to a unique place uh, to minister in that place. As close as we were to Elmbrook, we just felt the sense that, but we think that God is calling us to do something here in this place, and it is such a joy to be here. It's really uh, remarkable to see what you've done with this building. Brian was walking me around this week, and it was just kind of really amazing to be able to see it. But you all know what we know, that this isn't the church. Uh, the church arrived here this morning uh, at 845 and at 1030, right? This is the church. And if you're here for the first time, you're the church. Uh, we're all gathered together in this place with uh, anticipation that God will be present in this place and uh, will speak to us in ways that not only transform us, but transform the communities around us and the families around us too. So the bad news is this. I'm actually third string this morning. I, I really am. I am. So obviously first string is Brian. And uh, he, as you heard on the video, is up at, uh, at Fort, Wilton, Fort, Fort Wilderness. But Brian actually called my wife, Beth, who was a pastor at Elmbrook before Meadowbrook started, and asked her if she, asked her if she would come back and would speak this morning. I love that for a couple of reasons. One is, uh, she's really uh, great to listen to. She is a studied person who loves scripture and loves people, particularly loves students as a prof for a number of years, and um, it would have been great to have had her. But she's not doing well physically, and so she passed the baton to me. But the other reason I really like that Brian invited Beth to the, to the pulpit was just this passion was in our hearts from the very beginning, acknowledgement that God works through men and women together, that God does ministry not based on gender, but based on gifting, and the Holy Spirit knows no boundaries, and God is doing that work, and what I've appreciated about Brian and listening to him teach God's word as I've watched online is just this passion to study scripture well, and to look for what's there and to, and to be led by it. And I know that we can make decisions to jump into something because it seems culturally expedient to do so. The better decisions are actually to look at God's Word and to study it and see what it's saying and realize the Holy Spirit is remarkable and the Holy, the Holy Spirit uses everyone. And I am just thrilled uh, to be in this space with you. Disappointed that Beth couldn't be with you, so welcome to the third string, right? The beauty of the third string is because the Holy Spirit is the one who teaches, uh, we've got to go to help. So would you pray with me as we begin? Dear Lord, we thank you for the joy that we can have to be together in this place, to sing songs that remind us of who you are and um, who we are because we're cherished by you. And Lord, we pray that in your love for us this morning, that you would speak to us in ways that transform us, that you would help me to be helpful in my words and that you'd help us to surrender our hearts and our heads and our will to you um, to hear your words as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I know maybe three jokes. So here's one. There was a rancher in Texas, and he decided to hold a party on his massive estate. Don't know the reason why, but he gathered together 80, 100 people together for just a magnificent dinner in his, on his estate. And after dinner was over, he invited the crowd out to the courtyard for, dinner, for drinks and dessert afterwards. And in the middle of the courtyard, or off to the side of the courtyard, there was this massive pool. And in the pool was swimming a shark. I mean, like a really hungry shark, or at least it appeared to be so. And so the rancher, the host, said, I have a proposal for you. Just kind of tongue-in-cheek, I know no one will take me seriously. If anyone jumps in the pool and swims to the other side, you have a choice of one of three things. See, first of all, you could have my uh, summer home in Vail, Colorado. Or you could have half of my oil wells in East Texas. 
Or you could have my daughter's hand in marriage. You know, just, it was a joke, right? But before he finished, there was a splash, and all of the people that were around the pool looked, and they saw this young man struggling for his life to get across the pool and to emerge the other side. Everyone was surprised. I think the shark was probably surprised, too. Because the shark didn't get to a limb fast enough before this young man got out of the pool. And he's on the other side of the pool, and everybody is stunned, shark included. And the host says, well, what is it you want? I bet you want my summer home in Vail. You started with the least valuable thing. And the guy says, no, I I don't want your summer home in Vail. I said, oh, you want half of my wells in East Texas. He says, "I, I, I I don't want your wells in East Texas. You want my daughter's hand in marriage? And he said, I, I, I don't want your daughter's hand in marriage. And he said, well, well, what do you want? He said, what I want, what I want is to know who pushed me in the pool. <laughs> now, we would like to correct this young man, maybe console him. So let's start with the correction, first of all. When you are seized with an incredible opportunity for one of three really remarkable gifts to you, don't look to blame someone for the fact that you made it through the pool. That's a good idea and great advice. And then there's consolation to this young man. To say to this young man, I know you're pointing the finger of blame. You are not alone. That's what everybody does. It's true, isn't it? How easy it is for us to find ourselves in a situation we didn't anticipate or one that was worse than we thought it might be and for us to look around and say, who's responsible? It it is so easy, isn't it? Do you have a list? Of course you do. I do. And who's on that list? Is it your dad who didn't come through? Your kids who didn't live up to what you anticipated? Your parents who blew it? Your boss? The the episode you went through at work? What's on the list? Do you have a list? What's on the list? Who are the people you point at and say, it's, it's you? What are the circumstances you look at and say, it's these? You see, it's just so common for us to do it. What's remarkable to me is by the time we get to John chapter 9, we walk into a story that John is telling about Jesus' life And in the midst of the story, it is loaded with finger pointers. I hope there's something for us to learn here this morning as we ask the question, who's to blame? And whether that's even the right question to ask. So if you've got your Bibles, I understand there's some in the seats in front of you or a smartphone or whatever it is. Let me just look at John chapter 9. And we won't read the whole thing. I would encourage you to go back and take a look at it as... God encourages you to do so after we're done here today and throughout the course of the week. But I'm going to begin in John chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You see, the finger point has already begun. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work while I'm in the world. I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. And we read next that he put it on the man's eyes, washed it off, and he could see again. Well, words soon traveled, and the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, heard about it, and in verse 13, we read, as the story goes on, these words. They, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now, the day in which Jesus had made the mud 
and open the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, so they were divi- uh, this man is not from, from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But another asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. When they turned again to the blind man, they asked, what have you said about him? It was your eyes he opened. What have you to say about him? The man replied, he's a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been born blind and received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now we can see? We know he's our son, the parents answered, and we know he's born blind. But how we can see now, or who opens the eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he's of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That's why the parents said, he's of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I, I, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already, and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you, do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that's remarkable. You don't know where he comes from? Yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody's ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Do you see it? I mean, fingers pointing everywhere, right? All over the place as we look at this passage, we see it, first of all, in the very beginning of it where the disciples ask this question. Essentially, they're saying, show us who to point the finger at. Is it, is it him or, or is it his parents? And then the Pharisees that find fault with Jesus because he did this on the Sabbath. They want to know the details. You, you, he actually put mud together, made mud, and you actually washed your face. I mean, there's plenty of finger-pointing possibilities going on right here. And then to the blind man, they say, what do you have to say? Because they're going to accuse him. He seems somehow to be complicit in the matter. And then they go to his parents, and his parents, his parents point the finger at their son, boy, and blind. That's not the extent of it, really. I mean, even as people have read this text, outside of this text, they look at it, and some have wondered whether the finger blame should go to God. It's interesting that as this is translated, and we know that this was originally written in Greek, and so we translated it to English, and sometimes that's a difficult thing to do. And in this passage, it's actually a little bit difficult, more difficult to do too. It might seem like as you read the, pas- the passage that it sounds like Jesus is saying, well, God just wanted to bring glory to himself. So that's why this happened. And we'll talk a little bit about that verse in just a few minutes on, but it leads to this sense of, who is God? That God actually chooses to let a person be born blind and endure childhood and into adulthood blind because he wants to get glory? I mean, what kind of a loving father is that? And there are people that will look at this text and maybe even have other examples of the, uh, that represent their question. What, what kind of a God are you actually? So do you see there's finger pointing that goes on that, that, it, that is, just, uh, is just filled um, uh, with in accounts in this text. So what I want us to address this morning is this. How do we stop being finger pointers? What, what does that path look like? And, and John actually helps us with that here in, in John chapter 9. Let's just walk through this together. And the first thing I think we need to look at in taking a journey on the path that leads 
past blame is the reality we see here, that we would recognize that blame ruins. Blame ruins our life. We see it in the parents pointing their finger at their son. He, he's of age, ask him. I mean, frankly, I wonder how that lunchroom discussion went. You know, you just see the, the terrain that is destroyed along the way. Know this. Blame will ruin your life. It is as easy to fall into as it is devastating to fall into it. There's an incredible danger here. It's the same dangers that the disciples face. They they seek answers here, and and we look for answers to tell me who is responsible for this. And they ask the question, wise teacher, who's to blame for this mess? The danger is, as we point the finger, we become fault finders. We become blame assignment, uh, assigners. Where this leads is to this sense of definition of who we are. What has been done to me becomes me. What has been brought into my life that I never asked for has become the center point of the story of my life. You know, we ask the question, you know, what have I missed out on and why? What have I lost because of, I mean, who am I going to point at? Which one of you is it? You know, I can point the finger at myself, and I mean, we all do that, don't we? And you know by now how uncomfortable it is to keep pointing the finger blame at yourself. It it's actually far easier if I can shift it from myself to, to you or to her or to, to him. Or perhaps, what were you thinking, God? It's just possible to be able to go into those places and point the finger in those directions. But here's where it leaves us. It leaves us with bitterness It leaves us with desolation. It leaves us lonely. Our lives become fault-filled stories with names of people that we have cast aside and relationships that are icy, diminished, ruined at the end of my pointed finger. My dad my kids, my business partner, my spouse, that group of people. The life story we compose consists of a past that is marked by pain, a future that's marked by no hope that it will be any different, and a presence that is just deep in disappointment. Blame ruins you. I mean, perhaps it already has. Has it? Not one of us here is immune to it. The path away from that life is, first of all, to see the ruin that occurs because of pointing the finger blame. Friends, when I point my finger at the tip of of my finger, there is destruction. There will be destruction. When you point your finger at the tip of your finger, there will be room. It's simply what happens. Next time you point your finger, know that about what might incur in your life, in your heart, in the lives of of the people around you. The path towards wholeness is to see the ruin that occurs with blame. There's another aspect of this, and it comes next here in the text, and that is to realize the blindness that takes place in our lives when we do blame other people. Blame blinds us. The Pharisees were saying that the, that the person was... Um, doing something that was wrong. This man is not from God, the Pharisees said, 
for he does not keep the Sabbath. I mean, imagine this. They have constructed a theology that says Sabbath keeping is more important than sight restoring. The interesting feature in this account is it seems that the only person that has any eyesight at all is the person who just had it for the first time. I mean, maybe there's some value there, isn't there, in seeing things with fresh eyes, and that's what we see here. All of the others are blind. I mean, can you imagine it, that someone says rule-keeping matters more, particular rule-keeping about what you do and don't do on one day of the week matters more than life lived to its full. Blame brings with it stubborn blindness. I want you to do something. I want you to just take your hand. I want you to hold it out, and I want you to just do this. Yeah, three of you did that. Thank you. That's good. That's good. And, and you know what happens when you do this, right? You can't see very well anymore, right? I mean, the pointed finger obscures the sight line. And I, perhaps that's helpful in understanding what happens when we point the finger, we, we just lose our ability to really see what's going on in the situation. The Pharisees had lost their ability to see what was good. And I know it is easy to be wrong. Like the time, like the time when I blamed my wife for the keys that were misplaced, only to find them later on in my pocket where I had put them. I mean, but I was sure I was sure my wife needed some help with memory loss. (laughs) You see, it is so easy for us to be able to go those places. For those of you who who blame your parents for the way they raised you and then you had kids, right? For their faults, to blame your parents for your faults until you were their age. Have you ever blamed God for closing a door? You you had this interview for this position and and you were sure it was right for you and it didn't turn out. Only to discover later on that God provided something for you that was what you most needed. You see, we, we can be blinded to the reality of what is going on. And that's what blame does. It, it blinds us to those things. Or let, let's go into politics for just a brief moment. And can you imagine what, what's happening in this world because everybody's pointing the finger of blame? But you ever considered what might be happening in your life? You know, it's, it's interesting that we have all of these hopes or expectations because the promises are through the roof from the candidate that is your favorite candidate. I don't know which one it is. But you believe that if this person gets into office, everything's going to change But if you go back four years and eight years and 12 years, did it really change all that much? But you know what has has happened in the midst of that? Is the terrain of our relationships with the people closest to us. You're on the wrong side. You're on the wrong side. You're on the wrong side. And do you see what we were blind to? We were blind to the way it destroyed our life because we were so certain of promises that made, were made by someone who we will never see in person. Do you see what happens? The, the possibilities that occur with the blindness that takes place when we point the finger of blame that way. And I, I've said it out loud. It, it goes beyond pointing the finger of blame at me and, and others, but to be able to say to God, I mean, I, I've said it out loud. God, I am so absolutely disappointed with you right now. Have you ever been there? I am so, so disappointed with you right now. And you know what John's saying in John 9? Mark, what if you're blind? What if you're blind? What if you've misread who I am? And that's what we see here right now. John, Jesus, God, appealing to us to open our eyes. So here's the path. Blame can ruin. Blame can blind. But the message we find embedded in John 9 is this. 
all of that blame can be replaced. I don't mean just diminished. I mean just pulled out, set to the side, and inserting something else. Imagine the possibility of that. There are two realities that are noted in this chapter, and the first has to do with this man's reality. The story doesn't end right here. It doesn't end before Jesus comes along. And he recognizes this. He recognizes that the ashes of his life actually were ashes that were transformed. He didn't lose his life, but they were transformed in ways that gave glory to his life that he would have never imagined before. Inconceivable, God, that you would do that. And yet he says here, I once was blind, but now I can see. Story wasn't over. Thought it was. Story wasn't over. And all of those past stories, they just get reconfigured. Suddenly, the brothers are laughing about the time they had their blind brother thinking he was kissing a girl, was kissing a cow instead. I mean, wasn't that hilarious when that happened? And all of these other stories and terrain, even the heartaches, are somehow transformed by this reality. I once was blind, and now I see. There's just this deep conviction that the blind man is, is declaring to us that the story is not over yet. And that's what we see here. Blame is replaced by a reality that we know the story doesn't end with the devastation. And then there's another element of it too, is that, this is, that, that what, is, what is true here is that God is always working on behalf of those, love, those he loves, even in the absence of the answers. Did you notice in the very first part of this chapter that when Jesus is asked the question, who sinned, mom and dad, or the son, Jesus doesn't even answer it, except to say, none of them. So, so are you going to tell us who? He, he's not even interested in pointing the finger of blame anywhere. Now, there's something to learn from. There's something to learn. Jesus says neither, and then he goes on, and he goes on to say this. He goes to say, I am always relentlessly at work. Let's put the text up there and we can, we can see it. Here's the quote. Neither this man or his parents sinned. Now, in the original language, this is a full stop. There's no need for some explanatory words that you might see in your translations. In your translations. Literally, it is, neither this man or his parents sinned. Full stop. Now, here's the next sentence. But so that the work of God might be displayed in his life, we must do the work of him who sent me while it is still day. The message here isn't, I want to tell you what caused the matter. It is this, I want to tell you that God is concerned about the matter. And that even in the midst of the matter, God is relentlessly at work. God relentlessly pursues our best. The young man is letting us know the story is not over yet. Jesus wants us to know whatever the story is, God is there relentlessly at work in the circumstances that feel like tragedy and are prone to blame. God says, you don't even need to point the finger. Here's what you need to know. I'm at work. I'm there. And you might ask the question, well, I know what I've lost um, and the desolation that came with it. What will I gain if I replace blame with anticipation of you being at work in my life? Well, we can go places, and just, I'll just take a minute to parenthetically talk about what the Scripture says about that. I, one of my favorite places to go is in Paul's letter to the Galatians, in Galatians chapter 5. Eugene Peterson in the message just captures the fruit of the Spirit in a way that is so compelling to me and to others. Listen to what Eugene Peter says, P Peterson says about what God gives us. But what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives, much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, not pointing the finger of blame, affection for others, exuberance about life, not heartache and mourning, exuberance about life, serenity, a basic holiness we recognize permeates all people, not needing to force our way in life, 
able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. Friends, do you want that? God says, replace finger-pointing with the presence of God at work in your life, and this is the content of what I give. Jesus' intention, Jesus' calling, is to put on display the goodness of God in a broken world. Jesus' calling is to put on display the goodness of God in your broken world. That's what he's saying. Put your finger in your pocket. This is what God has for you. Know that your life is not over. Know that God is always working. Now you may say to me, those are fine words, Mark. Sounds like a great message. Uh, I don't know what I think. I know what I think. I absolutely believe it's true that God is relentlessly pursuing what is best for me and gives glory to God in the brokenness of my world. I believe it's true. Can I tell you about that story? Perhaps one of the most significant moments, years, when I discovered that actually occurred when a group of us were planting Meadowbrook Church. We had our offices over in Harwood. There was a, we were renting some space over there. And there was, a, there was a Friday afternoon, it was early afternoon, and I received a phone call from my dad. And my dad couldn't get a sentence out before he handed the phone to the sheriff's deputy, who then explained what had happened in my brother's life on April 19, 1991, in the middle of the afternoon. See, Mike and I grew up together. We shared room together, and we had hopes and dreams, and I heard Mike's. He loved to hunt and to ski, snow ski and water ski. He had a boat, loved to fish, loved the outdoors. He was a volunteer firefighter, and he loved law enforcement. And Mike had decided to be a sheriff's deputy. And on that, on that, after, on that Friday afternoon, Mike found himself in Grantsburg, Wisconsin, in, with a gun in his face. And he was shot in the chin and in an instant, Mike became a C2, C3 quad. My dad couldn't say anything, but the police officer let me know that my brother was bleeding out on the street and they didn't know whether he would survive or not. He was medevaced to a Minneapolis hospital and he was put in one of those beds that rotates and one of those frames that immobilizes your head as they drill screws into your skull. And it was devastating. I remember the plane ride from Milwaukee to Minneapolis. And I was asking God, why? I was doing more than asking. I was telling God how absolutely disappointed I was with him. 23 years went by, my brother in a wheelchair. He was hospitalized, medevaced to Denver, to Greg Hospital, where they were able to get him on a capacity to breathe on his own and be weaned from the vent. The hospital was filled with primarily young men prone to all sorts of kind of crazy injuries that break your life. And, uh, and the room, the, the hospital was filled with stories of, of, of people who were figuring out a way to sue somebody for what had happened to their husband, brother, son. I mean, Fingers of blame all over the place in that place. I'm not saying that we, we were immune to it, but I am saying this, that we had grown up in a family and the conviction was this. We believed that God could be trusted and that Jesus cared. And uh, it was tough going. There were a number of news articles that came out. There's an ancient, ancient uh, news piece that you can still find on YouTube. I want to just show you just a little bit of it because in it, you'll see a couple comments from my dad, a comment from my brother, and a comment from my mom, and you get a sense of the terrain of what we were challenged by. He says it's all right, you know, whatever God gives him. And uh, <clears throat> I feel pretty bad. I 
I've seen some of the guys that come in here and they don't have a good attitude about it and they just seem to be kind of miserable. So you got to have a good attitude and got to get along with people and joke and laugh and you have to. You know, one thing I have said so many times is that I've seen a lot of people that have been bitter and I'm just not going to be bitter. I'm going to, we're going to handle this just fine. Those were the early days, and we didn't know what was going to happen in my brother's life. But I will say this, that after 23 years of a life that could have been described as not the life we ever imagined or would ever want, in the midst of that, we saw time and time again keen expressions of Jesus at work. Mike's life turned out to be huge, stunning to us 23 years later when he died. There were, governor of Wisconsin was there and law enforcement people and little kids on the road saluting as the casket went by because Mike had been in their classrooms talking about what it meant to endure difficulty and challenges. It was remarkable actually, not the funeral so much as as the conversations day after day with Mike, the laughter, the gratitude, the keen sense that God was always at work, even in our family. My purpose here is not to draw attention to this story, except that it happened and we were supported by those that began this church years ago. There were actually people from this congregation that left Milwaukee and traveled up to Minneapolis to be with us. The, the DNA of this church is, is that kind of DNA, friends. But I don't share this because I want to talk about Mike. I know that in this room, you have stories just like this, don't you? Similar, similar in ways that you would be led to heartbreak and to pain and to questions and to wondering. But here's the reality. The reality is this, that God says, even on the canvas of your life that has already been painted, marked with heartache, and disappointment, and loss, and mistakes. On that canvas, Jesus says, that's where I do my work. I believe it's true because I've not only read it, I've experienced it. So what does that mean for you and for me? For some of you who are just maybe exploring Christian faith or done a whole lot of finger pointing towards God or what you thought, who you thought God was, I would encourage you to, um, as you consider giving your canvas to God, it's the best choice you could ever make. He does amazing work because he's always at work. And for those of you who would call yourself veterans that been around the block before, and yet you, you pull out of your pocket that list of people and circumstances and names and disappointments. Here's what I want to say to you. Throw the list away. Throw it away. Let go the blame. It ruins, it blinds. Let it go and give your story to Jesus. The whole story, the past regrets, fears about the future, and the disappointment today. Let go the blame and give Jesus your story. Would you do that? Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for being so absolutely relevant to the circumstances in our life. What a remarkable book you've given us. Truth in it that um, I think we really want to believe. But I pray that you would guide us as we spend time now in your presence, reminded of our need for your presence in our life, to speak to us of the things we need to hear yet now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.